Who is God? God is love. Only God, only the God of Christianity is truly the God of love. Why? Because our God is three persons. Uh, this was never more clear to me. I was on an airplane once, and w I fly a lot. And whenever I fly, I always bring a book. I look forward to airplane trips for the single, singular reason that I get a lot of time to read. But unfortunately, it doesn't usually work out that way. Because I'm usually reading a book on theology or scripture. I don't read a lot of fiction. I, you know. So I sit down on the airplane, and I'm sitting there with a book with Jesus on the cover, right? And invariably, somebody will say, oh, what are you reading there, you know? And I always, oh, talk on it. Try to hide the book cover, you know? <laughs> because usually that's about the rest of the trip right there, right? I remember one time I sat down, I was reading a book. Some guy said, oh, what's that you reading there? Are you religious? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, what religion are you? Are you Christian? Even better, I'm Catholic. <laughs> Well, son, he said, he was an elderly man. Well, son, by the time you get to my age, you'll realize all the world religions are the same. They're all the same. I said, well, actually, that's incorrect. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, you'll find out when you get to be my age. And I said, no, that's actually not true. I'm, I teach theology. I have my PhD in theology. I've studied this quite a bit, and they're not all the same. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, how are they different? And I said, well... For one thing, Christianity teaches that God is love. And he rolls his eyes. He says, all the religions say that. And I said, yeah, but they don't mean it. <laughs> and he said, that's a bold statement. And I said, well, it's true. He said, well, I'm pretty sure they think their God is love. I said, yeah, but they don't really mean it. I said, because their God, if they say, my God is the God of love, my God is love. What they're saying is there's one solitary person who says, I have all the love there is in me. I have all love. All the love is in me that I need. Just call me Dr. Love. <laughs> and started, getting, started using the derisive tone that he was using, right? I can shoot right back. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, they would really say that their God is love. Christianity says it too. I said, yeah, but we mean it because our God is three persons. Our God is one God with three persons. And the reason our God is love is because the Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father and the Father and the Son, the love that they share is the Holy Spirit. So our God is love, but his love is not selfish. It's selfless. No other God can say that. He said, that's clever. <laughs> I never heard that one before. I said, well, I didn't make it up. I, I, Jesus did, right? <laughs> it's the truth. Our religion is, so what does it take to enter into heaven? Well, what is heaven? God's life of love. So what do you have to learn to enter into heaven? Love. You can't be in the life of love if you don't love, right? So can God just create everybody in heaven? Why doesn't God do that? One of my students asked me once in, in class, J.P. Callahan, why didn't God just create us all in heaven? Why did he have to put a whole test here, you know? <laughs> because God doesn't want to program you like a robot. Love means a free choice, right? If we were just forced to love one, yes, God, I love you, you know, <laughs> that wouldn't be love. It has to be freely given, right? So the angels have to be given a choice to learn love. How do you do that if you're an angel? Can they give their life? Well, angels don't have matter, so they can't die, right? The reason that you and I can die is because we are made up of matter. We have stuff. And the thing with matter is you can take it apart, all right? Matter can be divided, and that's what death is, decomposition, right? So I can die because my soul can be separated from my body. But an angel doesn't have matter. It's not made of stuff. Angel is pure spirit. So an angel can't die because there's nothing to separate, right? Just pure spirit. So how does an angel learn love? Not by dying in the sense of losing their life. They're, they're all, they can't do that, right? Just like your soul can't die. Your soul is immortal. Why? 
because your soul has no parts, all right? Your soul is a spirit. There isn't a top side of your soul and a bottom side of your soul, all right? So that's why your spirit will live forever. Even Greek philosophers who were pagans figured that out because they understood if it doesn't have any parts, it can't die, right? Your body can die, though, right? But an angel, how did they learn love? Well, it seems to me that Revelation 12 explains to us why the angels fall. Why do the angels fall? Revelation 12, a sign was seen in heaven. There was a woman with a crown on her head. And she gave birth to the one who rules all. And a war arose in heaven. Why did a war arise in heaven? Because what the angels saw is we are going to have to subject ourselves to a human? What are you talking about? Look at me. I'm an angel. I'm all, I'm, I'm, I cannot die. I'm pure spirit. So powerful. And now we have to do what? Bow down to a human? I can't do that. That would mean squandering all the many gifts that God has given me. I have to lay that down at the, of a dirty, stinking, rotten human being? So the fathers and doctors like Aquinas and Augustine suggest that the angels are aware in some way of the incarnation because of Revelation 12. And the devil... Sins in pride. He does not want to worship a man. And so what does he see? God is going to use one of them, make a human their head, that God himself will become a man? What a slight. Why not one of us? Why doesn't God become an angel? Now, at first you might think, this seems kind of silly. He'd be so prideful. And then you realize, we see it all around us. You're riding down the freeway. Somebody cuts you off. You don't cut me off. You can cut other people. You don't cut me off. You understand what I'm saying? Not me. Right? We see it from the time we're little kids, right? This is my side of the line right here. See this line in the back seat of the car? This is my side of the line. You don't come over into my side of the line. It's even worse if you're the older brother. I was the older brother, right? You don't go in my room. What are you doing in my room? You touched my thing. You show me respect. Right? You become like a mafia guy in your own family. Those of you with kids know what I'm talking about, right? Did you touch my stuff? Did, did, just tell me, did you touch my stuff? Forget about it. You don't even want to touch my stuff, right? Let me make you an offer you can't refuse. You don't touch my stuff again, I won't pound your face in, right? Human nature, especially the older brother. In fact, you see it all throughout salvation history, right? To be an older brother in scripture doesn't usually work out too well. There's Cain and Abel, okay, there you go, right? There's Ishmael and Isaac, okay? There's Isaac. There was Esau and Jacob. And he's starting to get the... the David had six older brothers. <laughs> God always picks the younger one. When God tells Israel, you're my firstborn son, that should make them concerned. <laughs> and then you read about them falling, it's like, yeah. <laughs> right? Why does God always do this? He chooses the younger. Why? To shame the proud. To humble the proud. Right? God chooses the weak. He always chooses the younger brother. God always chooses the weak to use. God always chooses the weak. God always calls the weak. If you feel like God is calling you to be a witness to him, it's not a compliment. Don't get full of yourself. He picked you. Remember, there was Saul, the king in the Old Testament, the first king. He was tall, dark, and handsome, looked a lot like me. And 
What are you laughing for? Anyway. And then he fa fell, and so God raised up a shepherd boy named David. God always chooses the weak to shame the proud. God raises up a woman, and God becomes a man, emptying himself, taking the form of a slave. And some of the angels say, oh, no. We can't go there. That's not what this is about. So what does the devil try to do to those of us that God calls? What does Revelation 12 say? He is the accuser. The devil always wants to accuse you. God picks the weak. Embrace being weak. Embrace being small. Embrace being nothing. Remember what they said about Jesus? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Remember that? I love it when people say, oh, you're at what school? John Paul the Great Catholic University? What's with that? I've never even heard of that school before. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard of that. It's like, where is that? Is it, is it brand new or something? USD is way bigger. They've got like 16,000 students. How many students do you have? About, about 150. What <laughs> school is that? I love that. I always, whenever I get that, it's like, can anything good come out of San Diego? You know? <laughs> Right? <laughs> Embrace it. The devil wants to convince you that you're not up to the snuff. God, God if, you, if you feel humble, then God can use you. The devil wants to attack you and make you feel like you're not good enough. He'll play on that. He'll remind you of all the sins that you've committed and all your weaknesses and all your limitations. Oh, I'm not smart enough. I'm not knowledgeable enough. I'm not a good enough speaker. I'm not a good enough communicator. I'm not holy enough. The devil always is there to accuse you, holding you back. I always say this, the next time the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. <laughs> Amen? Because God wants to raise up the weak to shame the, the proud. So what happens as a result of God revealing to the angels that their head, the head of all creation, because one creature will be the head of all creation, who is that? That's Christ, becomes man, is going to be a man. The angels rebel. And so they turn on the head, Christ, and they follow one of their own. We're going to stick with one of our own. We don't want to follow one of those humans. We're going to stick with one of our own, the devil, Satan. By the way, this should be a warning against clickishness. You know what I'm talking about? Sectarianism. Archbishop Fulton Sheen once pointed out that diabolical is related to the word to divide. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is how the, the devil wants to destroy the church. He's the accuser. And so what he loves to do is get faithful Catholics to turn on one another. Oh, you're not Catholic enough because you don't say this prayer. Oh, you're not Catholic enough because you don't wear that t-shirt. Oh, you're too Catholic. You're a weirdo. <laughs> oh, you, you know, you're holier than thou. What the devil wants to do is tear us apart. That's the way the devil divides the mystical body. He's all about that, you see? He's the accuser. Whenever you feel that spirit of dissension, of gossip, what the catechism calls detraction, what is the sin of detraction? Saying truthful things about other people that highlight their weaknesses. Well, I'm, I'm just telling the truth. That doesn't make it right. Doesn't make it right. We, there's no need to talk about other people's shortcomings and failures. We got enough enemies on our hands. Amen? Amen. We have enough enemies to fight. We have the spiritual powers behind, behind the scenes, the devil and his angels. So from the very beginning, the devil sees a man. And so what does the devil want to do? I want to kill him. I want to slay him. Jesus says that the devil was a murderer from the beginning. That the devil sinned from the beginning, 1 John 3, 8. In fact, the fathers of the church go back in the scripture 
into the book of Isaiah, chapter 14. There the Lord says to the king of Babylon, the most wretched empire on earth at the time. And the Lord says to him, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. Above the stars, I will set my throne on high. I will, set, I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the depths of the pit. This is about the king of Babylon. But the fathers of the church recognize that this isn't about a simply the human king of Babylon. Babylon is the image for the kingdom of hell. And so who is this ultimately referring to? Origen in the third century says, it is most clearly proved by these words that he who formerly was Lucifer. What does Lucifer mean? Bearer of light. He is, it's, it comes from Isaiah 14, the day star. That the devil was the most powerful of all the angels. And so why does he turn on the Lord? Well, an angel can't die. But what is the equivalent of death for an angel? Divesting himself of all of his glory and bowing down at the feet of a man. Our Lord. And even more humiliating is to recognize that in the sign, there's a queen as well. And who is she? The Blessed Mother. Queen of the angels. So because of this, the devil has hatred for humanity. Wisdom, 224. But through the devil's envy, death entered into the world. Not because the devil hates man, but because God chose to become a man. And so what does the devil want to do? He sees what God has chosen over him, and he wants to degrade it. He wants to destroy it. I have a quotation here from one of my favorite theologians, Matthias Joseph Shaben. And this is how he explains the fall of the angels. He says this, This appalling mystery of sin considered in its origin, becomes in turn a beacon which serves to throw light on the entire subsequent course of, him, of sin. It permits us to peer into the depths of hate with which the devil pursues man. He persecutes man not only because man is destined to succeed to the glory which he himself has lost, but much more because man is a member of the body of God's son. The devil hates man for one reason, because he sees that man will get what Believers will get what he failed to attain. Misery loves company. Again, parents, you're aware of this, right? If you punish one of your... I remember when I was a kid, right? I do something wrong, and my mom would say, go sit on your, the couch till your dad gets home. And then I'd be stuck in the living room on the couch. So what was my mission? To bring all four of my sisters... My sister, Nora, we would come in. What are you doing? Come over here. My mom would come out. Don't talk to him or you're going to sit on the couch. Right? I'm having fun. Look at him on the couch. Look at him on the couch. This is so cool. Look at these pillows are like shield. I'm on a boat, you know. And before you know it, my dad would come home. There'd be five little kids sitting on the couch. <laughs> right? Misery loves company. Right? If you're... If you've given yourself over to sin and you see goodness, you want to destroy it where you see it. Tear it down. Point out all the faults. But even more, the devil hates man because man is united to God. Because he has joined himself to, to men as their head. He does not rest or halt until he has likewise destroyed the human race, until he has set up his reign, the reign of death on earth until he has treacherously enticed men to pay homage to him instead of the Lord's anointed, to adore, adore him and to bring him offerings, offerings of death, of ignominy, of deepest degradation. The devil says, what, you're going to worship a man? No, worship me. I'm better. Why should I worship man? Man should worship me. And so what does the devil do? What do the demons do? They set themselves up as false gods so that men will worship them. Idolatry. And 
The demons love to see man degraded because they hate mankind so much that what do they want to see? Humans bring human sacrifice. Humans perform sexual immorality to destroy man as part of these pagan religions. More fiercely still, he does, does he persecute the human race in the person of those who after Christ's incarnation join his colors and who seek to destroy the empire of hell in themselves and in others. And since it was a woman, a mere human being, who has mother of God man, uh, the mother of the God man, was to become the queen of the angels, hell's hate had to turn especially against this woman, as well as against her entire progeny. Why do we see so much hatred for the church? Notice, when you turn on television, you don't see people say, oh my Buddha, <laughs> when they are frustrated. People don't take the name of Muhammad in vain. Have you ever noticed that? You know, people say, Muhammad. <laughs> Buddha. No, but they'll use Jesus Christ as a curse word. It's mysterious. Why? The hatred that we see for Christ cannot be explained. The evil that we see at Sandy Hook cannot be explained by appealing to natural perversion alone. There's a mystery of sin. That means a mystery is something you can't fully comprehend, right? That's what a mystery is, the mystery of the Trinity. We can't fully comprehend the Trinity. That doesn't make the Trinity irrational. It just means it goes beyond our power to understand it, right? It's like explaining color to a blind person. How would you explain color to a blind person, right? Well, what's color? All right, well, it's, there are different shades. Okay, like what? Well, there's light. And there's darker colors. Okay, what is that? Well, it's like differences of the light. I don't get it. Okay, you, you know what you see now? I don't see anything. Well, that's black. <laughs> what colors? It's kind of like warm and soft, and blue is kind of colder. Oh, so if I touch a color, it's cold? No, 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 no. So if I put it in my mouth, it's cold? No, 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 no. Well, then why is it warmer or colder? I don't know. That's what people say, you know? <laughs> well, then color doesn't make any sense. It's illogical. Since it's illogical, I can't believe it. It's irrational. It must not be true. No, no. No, it's just you don't have any kind of experience to explain color. Well, the same thing is true of the Trinity in a certain way. The Trinity is beyond our comprehension. We just can't fully understand it. But the same thing's true of sin. There's a mystery of sin that we can't fully understand. And here I'm going to say something that I'm hesitant to, to offer, but because the fathers and doctors and John Paul II himself have mentioned it, I think I might as well bring it up. You're all familiar with the, the way the mystical body of Christ works, right? That we are all united in Christ and that little good works can be grouped up with other people's good works so that our little good works are accomplished, are able to, far, to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think. Why? Because we're part of the mystical body of Christ. Amen? But did you know that John Paul II, quoting Augustine and others, speak also of not just the mystical body of Christ, but the mystical body of Satan? That we can say, oh, well, that's just a venial sin. That's not a big deal. But did you know that our little sins can be the cause of such great tragedy, we can't even get our minds around it. I think of that young man who shot up that school and I don't know him, and I don't know if I can trust the reports. But what I hear is he spent a lot of time playing video games, violent video games. And you might think making a violent video game is bad, but it's not that bad. It's just like, you know, it's for entertainment, right? I mean, how bad can it? Well, this is what the mystical body of Satan does. He can take our little venial sins, and when he pulls them all together with the other sins that we're in league with every time we sin, he can use them to accomplish far more abundantly than we could ever ask or think. The mystery of sin. Shaban says, do not the awful atro atrocities of heathendom, particularly human sacrifices, the cult of foul vice in its most unnatural forms, as also the systematic attack against Christianity with all the weapons of falsehood and calumny, thus find their fullest expression or explanation. The passions of men would never at least on such an enormous scale, lead them to rage so ferociously against themselves. 
I mean, animals kill each other, but what, not with the kind of maliciousness that human beings do. The passions of men would never, at least on such an enormous scale, lead them to rage so ferociously against themselves and to attack the most exalted ornament of their race. They can be brought to pass, this can be brought to pa pass only by the craftiness and deceit of him who envies them. But in giving heed to his promptings, they can and actually do arrive at such extremities that once the incarnation of the Son of God is laid before them and the command to adore them as their God, their King, and the source of their happiness is issued to them, they too break into fury, rise against a heavenly king with superhuman malice, vaunt themselves above him, and seek to destroy him together with his kingdom. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to open our eyes. What we see around us, even the small venial sins that we think are no big deal, are part of the empire of hell. There's the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of hell. And the devil wants nothing more than to see all of us subjected to him. He thirsts for power, for might, for glory. And how does Jesus reign? From the cross. By giving himself in love. That is what it's going to take to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And we see it most beautifully in our blessed mother. When at the word of the angels, she says, let it be done unto me according to your word. Her consent to God's plan. Her giving over her whole self, her whole life to our Lord. If we are going to confront the culture of death, we need to turn to our blessed mother and recognize that it's only going to be through following her example that we can overcome the wiles of the devil. We need to turn to St. Michael, the archangel, and the angels that surround us and ask them to illuminate our minds, to help us recognize the small ways the devil is conspiring in our culture to use even the smallest infraction as part of his plan. Let us ask the Lord to give us the same grace he poured out on the one who is full of grace and ask him for the gift of faith. Tomorrow, I'm going to pick up on this talk and I'm going to talk about the Bible and culture and why reason alone can't redeem our culture. We always fall into the temptation, it seems, every four years. Whenever there's an election of somehow imagining that it's going to be through an election that we might be able to redeem the world. And as I always like to point out, we forget Jesus lost the only election he was ever in. The crowd chose Barabbas. And yet, he saved the world, right? It's not going to be through political might that we conquer the devil. But as we read in Revelation 12, joining with the Son in loving not our lives unto death and being sons and daughters of his mother following her example. Let us turn now in prayer and ask the Lord to give us his guidance. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. teach everything he commanded them to teach. New ways to communicate God's word. Present positive images to our people. This message of truth and salvation. Culture of uh, encounter. Gospel of Christ worldwide. Shalom World TV. Twenty four seven, faith filled, dynamic, virtue building, commercial free, family friendly, Catholic charismatic channel to the whole world. Promote the gift of church teaching. 
dedicated for the new evangelization. Mentor the young into a deeper embrace of the Catholic faith. Wonderful contributions to the church. People of prayer. Attractive people, attractive messages. Peace of Christ. Promote the values of life. This is media at its very best. The voice of the church. great love. Taking this to the next step. Shalom World TV. Shalom. 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 Shalom World. God's own channel.